There are three things that I do every day which changed the game of my body. People ask me all of the time about how much I work out, what I eat, et cetera, et cetera. But over the years of healing my own body and working with others, I've learned that the reason so many women are struggling with weight gain and body stuff, especially in perimenopause, is because of their habits. Our habits are things we don't really think about that don't actually even require much energy. They're on autopilot, which is great, except if they are sucking our energy or creating inflammation in our body. Then we don't always recognize the role that we ourselves are playing in our own weight gain or energy suck, which can be frustrating and confusing. I have nights out with friends also. I feel hunger the next day because I'm tired. And yes, I eat junk food. But these are once in a while. They don't make my life and aren't actual habits. Sister, it's your small, seemingly insignificant habits that make all of the difference. And for me, my three habits always include this. One, starting my day with greens. Specifically, the greens I love are from Organifi. They give all my listeners a 20% off. If you use my name as a discount code, I'll put the link here in the show notes. It is a simple powder that I put a scoop in a large shaker cup, shake up with ice and water, and drink as the first thing that hits my gut microbiome in the morning. It sets the tone for my day. It nourishes my energy. It nourishes any cravings I might have later. And everyone I know who tries these greens recognizes that they feel a difference in their energy, in their digestion, in their bowels if they struggle with constipation, and definitely in their cravings within three to four days. It's like magic, but it's not. It's a simple habit that sets your tone in your body for the day. My second habit is that I always follow my P4 formula, which keeps me focused on the sleep, mindset, movement, and nutrition habits that create solid health foundations. Remember that a body in chaos will not respond to tactics and trendy hacks. We have to create that foundation. And once you do, you can have vacations, you can have nights out, you can go and do things and live your life without the stress that comes from quote unquote breaking diets or overeating all the time. You know your foundations are there and the moment you go through a period of of excess or enjoyment, you just go right back to those foundations. If you need help with your strategy or you're sick of Googling and trying to piecemeal it together, make sure you join us in the Perimenopause Posse. It is the cheapest and most affordable way for you to grab my P4 formula, all the strategy, get your questions answered, be supported by other women, have real live coaching calls with me, which costs a lot of money if you want to work one-on-one with me. So if you're looking for something self-paced, it's going to take all the questions out of this for you. And of course, the third habit I always keep is that I have a coach at all times because mindset is the biggest part of success, period. Whether it's your own growth, whether it's success in business or in your career, whether it's improving yourself as a parent, whether it's in your relationship, or whether it's in your health and your relationship with your body. Having a coach or someone who helps you see outside of the frame of reference is always going to get you there faster. That's why the top most successful people in the world invest in this no matter what, whether they're athletes or business people or any aspect of success you can find period. Okay, sisters, let's dive into this episode, but make sure your habits are on point. Swipe up to grab any of the links I talked about and to connect further and make sure you're not wasting your life feeling badly about habits that really can make you feel better than you already do. What's up, sisters? Welcome to the Period Whisperer podcast. I'm Bria. I'm your host. If you're new, I'm so happy you are here. I'm your perimenopause and menopause sister, your holistic trainer, hormone specialist, translator of your female body. I'm a recovering people pleaser and hustle addict turned body whisperer and hormone decoder. And I am here to help you de-stress your body, decode what it is saying, become the CEO of it, and own your own health, energy, and weight loss again. 
This show is for you, the overwhelmed, overworked, underappreciated step woman who dreams of a body they feel strong, energetic, and sane in. The woman who knows that she shouldn't just wave the white aging flag and believes in a body and life of peace, love, and purpose. But you don't just know how to get there yet. So if you are stuck in your body, your energy, your life, you are in the right spot. Let's lean in and learn what our bodies are saying to us. What's up, sisters? It's Bria here, your host of the Period Whisperer podcast. Um, And I am not alone today. I am really excited to have a guest here, Dr. Alex Golden, who's an MD. Uh, And along with her her business partner, Megan Blacksmith, who's a health coach, she is the co-founder of Zesty Ginger, a company founded on the principles of compassionate transformation. And they specifically help women restore optimal health through a combination of functional medicine, mindset, and subconscious reprogramming. So sort of all those areas. And they're the founders of the Transformation Accelerator Coaching Program, Health Transformation Accelerator and Flight or Flight Fix. But I found them through their four phase cycle podcast, which is a really amazing podcast that uh, helps women just like us, you know, take back our vital female health by really learning to work with the natural cycles of the body rather than against them. Sound a little familiar? We talk about this a lot on the podcast. So I'm so excited, Dr. Alex, to have you here. Can I call you Dr. Alex? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome. It's uh, it's such a pleasure to have you here, you know, to have your expertise and to talk about this area. Um, Thank you. I love nerding out about this. So literally anytime. I love this. I was talking to someone else about nerding out and geeking yeah. out about this stuff. You know, it's like, I'm just so yeah. happy to listen to anything that just really targets in on, on this part of us. And absolutely. You know, I, what I have found, you know, it sounds like we've both been in, you know, the wellness industry for a lot of years, but I have found in, in, in myself even a really significant lack of education around this. Oh topic. my goodness. It is off the charts. I mean, the, the, we've even had uh, classes that we put on that are like what you didn't learn in high school health class, right? Because the whole, the whole point really is, is that women tend to be very fascinated about this stuff. And I would even just say humans, humans are fascinated about knowing more about ourselves, Mm -hmm. right? This whole journey of we pop into here and it's a discovery of who we are Mm -hmm. to leave out considerable portions of any part of ourselves inherently doesn't feel good to us. And we know that. And that's why when we take note of things, like when I learn about my body and I learn to navigate myself, I have a better experience with that. And I'm healing the relationship between me and me. Mm -hmm. Really, I think most of us are all about that, right? So while I have many things to say on how lacking it is, (laughs) and we can certainly talk about that, You know, I think we are all on board with that idea, but I think the importance of it then becomes even more heightened when we say, well, why do we even like it so much when it does appear, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, why does it feel so good to us to learn about this? And and that's my argument for it, is that this, this is the crux of empowerment for people. And because we are handed a Ferrari, and then we park it in the driveway and we take the bus instead, right? We have the supercomputer, we have this cycle, we have this physiology that is geared to flow with life and optimize us for different things at different times so that we are equipped with all tools across the board. And, but we're not given a manual for any of that, right? That's the Ferrari and we have it parked. I we're love taking- that. I we're love taking the bus. Example. Yeah. So it's right, like because as women, we've been given the Ferrari is what you're saying because yes. of the uh, and, and Megan's analogy instead of the Ferrari and the bus is, is refrigerator. So like think about this is the um, male, female physiology is mm-hmm. right. Why is the cycle so important? But also why do women have so many problems with it? And why do we need to understand how it works? She talks about the different refrigerators, like an old school refrigerator from the 80s. We all probably still have one or somewhere in like the garage where you keep your drinks. Right? It's still working. 
it like it doesn't have that many buttons and bells and whistles and it just like runs right whereas like a lot of these newer refrigerators it'll like sing to you and it'll make your coffee and it'll like type you up on the screen and it'll like tell you when you're low on ice and all of this stuff but it breaks more Mm. So women have these super intricate, complex, flowing, cyclical physiologic factors that impacts everything from what we experience in our body to also what we think and feel and do. But we look around and we're like, but why are women impacted by more stuff, right? Why why is there more dysfunction, it seems? Because people will say stuff like, well, I see my husband trying to lose weight and he just thinks about not eating bread and he loses weight, right? Why does it work like that for them? Mm. So layered into you know the fact that we're no one is taught about their body. We kind of conveniently ignore a a lot of sexuality and and that health-related matters, Mm -hmm. which of course is not even about that. Your period is not about sex. Your period is about who you are. But um, when we are not given the understanding of that, but it's a complex system that things can go wrong and it's actually very dangerous to not understand it. You You are not then equipped to navigate the experience of actually directing the bumps in the road. And that is why women full on have babies and go through birth and go through pregnancy and then come out the other side. And they're like, I don't even really understand how my vagina works. Mm. Right. And like everybody in the hospital room saw it (laughs) or I don't even feel good about it. (laughs) So there's a lot here that we just kicked off, right? That these are complex things. But the cool part is the solution, at least the beginning part of the solution is easy. This kind of conversation is that it's like, if we just all put it out there and we're talking about it and we're equipping people and we're saying, Hey, that you have a Ferrari, here's the key. You turn it to the right to unlock it. If you grab the little handle on the side and you pull it towards yourself, it opens. That is the kind of thing that we are using as the the strategy to overcome the the doubt the fear oh my gosh i'm squatting again what does it mean will i ever have kids what, what about my daughter what when if i had problems what will happen with her fertility how will i go into menopause yeah. all of these things are an extension of i'm unsupported and unresourced to answer those questions now i'm scared mm. or now i'm frustrated now i'm in fear now yeah. i'm guilty and shame of why am I like the way I am? This must just be my personality. When none of that is true, none of that is actually true. It's literally just how does one navigate this? Mm -hmm. And what do, what does any one person need to walk that path in a way that empowers them? Mm -hmm. It's not up to an outside person to decide, but it's up to each individual woman really speaks to us like taking responsibility to know and feeling empowered to know ourself, right? To know our side. Yes. And so that's fascinating that you just said that <laughs> because that is the conclusion that we have come to because there's so much of what happens in the health journey, especially with periods and hormones that we get gaslit on or like, oh, your labs are fine or this and this, right? And so for a while, there's a lot of healing that happens with it. And usually this pendulum ends up swinging in the direction where people are like, oh, I'm so mad that I haven't been taught about this. Mm. I think that that is a very appropriate thing to emotionally process. And I think that there's lots of healing that needs to happen when we have experiences like that, because those are valid and they require compassion. At the same time, a lot of what also happens that people then still won't go and pick up the empowerment and say, what does it look like? Even though this happened to me, how do I become the leader to model something differently? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people are saying, I've been hurt, therefore I'll do this. Mm -hmm. As opposed to actually, well, it does suck that I didn't get taught about this. And it does suck that I maybe got mistreated. But actually, if I want to look out in the world and see something different, then I take responsibility for being different and role modeling that and creating a different world that is actually powerful. That's like standing in your power. That is saying, 
okay, it is what it is, but it becomes what I make it, yes. right? Yes. And this is the permission I think that we hope to give as we talk about it and normalize this yeah. is, a, is permission to recognize that we get to control the outcome. Right. So you don't like it, make it different. Yeah. And make it different. <laughs> I wonder And I got you- stuck there for a long time. I was kind of like, I was just mad about it, yeah. but it yeah. broke me out to tr- to totally break that apart and say, cool. And I don't have to be that anymore. Yeah, which is really a better feeling, right? It's yeah, better. exactly. I want to go back just quickly to what you said that kind of stuck with me already when you said, we think our periods are really about like getting pregnant and having babies, but yeah. it's really about who you are. What yep. do you mean by that? Yeah. So that is a, that this is, you're right. This is a fascinating topic mm-hmm. because having a cycle is inherent to of the feminine experience right Mm -hmm. the the physical body plays a role in that Mm -hmm. and then the other aspects of ourselves the mental emotional and spiritual bodies then all interface with that That is why no one part of us, I could actually make that statement from many different avenues, Mm -hmm. right? Because what we're saying is your identity is created by incorporating all of those parts of who you are, Mm -hmm. mind, heart, body, soul. And so the physical body then becomes a really important extension of that because if you are experiencing it or thinking it or feeling it, it is being registered registered by a physical vessel that you are in. As in, That's why we say thoughts aren't free. If you walk past a mirror and think you're fat or I hate you or I'm ugly, yeah. you just release chemical messengers that sent that message. Now you have flooded the central nervous system with those chemical messengers. You are now different. You have actually released that. And so none of it is free, right? That's why when people are trying to take a bunch of supplements and heal their period and get their period, and then the rest of the month they're doing whatever, or they do all the healthy stuff and then think uh, mean things about themselves or talk to themselves or let people step over their boundaries or stay in relationships that they have no business being in. All of those things then go back to and they feed off each other. So it really becomes an important part of your period is evidence of who you are. Mm-hmm. Therefore, if it's not going well, that you're saying all of you, there are parts of you that are discongruent with one another. And now you're seeing it manifested in front of you physically. Yes. It's a really powerful indicator of what is yes. in your body. That's why the only biomarker I track anymore is ovulation. Not because I'm trying to get pregnant anymore. I'm out of that phase of my life, but because it's the only one that matters for me in the way that I think. Right. Now, of course, just depending on seasons of life and what's relevant for you, I'm not saying for everybody it's the only biomarker. But for me personally, for me to ovulate, I know I'm not predominantly living in fight or flight. I know that my thoughts are not leading me to ha- stay in emotional states that are downregulated or to upregulate, right? Anxiety, depression, second guessing of fight or flight, freeze, all of these things are then the the ovulation and therefore exactly how your period goes is a direct extension of all of those things. So it's really just looking at the ultimate outcome. You're looking at the picture created at the end. So when we don't enjoy some parts of that, the invitation is there to take care of all of who you are and not take care of your period. The period will get taken. It's the same as money, right? If people don't like where they are with money, it's actually not a money thing. It's who you are as a human being. And the money is the manifestation of how you think, feel. Because if you say, I don't have money and I can't have it and I won't have it and there's no way for me to get it, that is who we are. And our actions will then reflect it and you keep not having money. So, it, you know, all of these things, really, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about period or some other outcome. It's all interlinked. And thank God, because if you if it's all interlinked, you can start pulling the thread in one location and get to the other side. It won't matter where you start. So you have lots of options. 
I'm a, I'm totally obsessed with what you just said there. Like, <laughs> you're right, like it's so the fun, problem right? is not our period. The period is a result of other issues inside of us, which means when we become different, we make different choices, we think different, we act different. The period will resolve itself. Totally, because not be what is the definition of symptoms? A symptom is a conversation that your body is having with you on what's happening underneath the hood. You change the conversation, you change the symptoms. Yeah. But that's always going to be linked like that. And so something that you're, uh, it was interesting. I know I talked to a lot of people and recently I had a a great example of this, of someone being like, I have ended up and diagnosed with estrogen dominance. And it was like a state she was in. And and it was a really interesting discussion to start unraveling it and, and have her be reminded that you have to recreate estrogen dominance every single cycle. So you have to recreate the scenario and the environment and the action and the thoughts that got you there that first Mm -hmm. cycle to get there the second cycle you actually just don't stay there on your own you are doing the things now that's not blame you didn't get to doing the things on your own right so if you didn't create it you don't take a hundred percent responsibility either this is not where Mm -hmm. we interject guilt and shame onto our past but what we can say is Since you have an opportunity every month, anything that gets recreated month by month by month is then something that we contribute in perpetuating. Mm -hmm. And as long as we're courageous enough to see it like that, then we can backtrack out of it. Because if you can perpetuate it, you can stop perpetuating it. You Mm -hmm. can change and then the outcome changes. And the only sticking point there is the belief of, well, I failed in the past, therefore I can't. Yeah. And really, the only thing that is the answer to that is that's because you didn't have the resources to do it. Mm-hmm. Right. It's not that it can't be done because other people are out doing it. If you mm-hmm. can't do it, it just means you don't have the resources to do it. There's nothing magical yeah. about it. This is what I love so much about what you guys do is that you would you consider and bring to light like you highlight or put you know a spotlight on like the past trauma that we have that we carry around with us like luggage as well as what is actually going on right now both in as you say kind of that emotional side that mindset side of the mental side and the physical side so Mm -hmm. you really kind of cover you know all those trifectas all those trilogies of you know past present future body mind heart and soul and I think that's you know because you cannot holistically heal without really looking at the whole picture Absolutely. Because I would argue that really um, disease and unhappiness is a direct result of fragmentation within yourself. Mm -hmm. There are walls that you erect between yourself. So any part of you that's like, I can heal. And then any part of you that says, but I failed in the past, so maybe I can't. Mm -hmm. There's a wall between them. They can argue over it. But at some point, you can build a high enough wall between you and you that you won't even have the insight to see it. So that's why people will do goofy stuff. Like they say they want love and they'll try to get close to someone. But when you get close to someone, then you start pushing them away. Self-sabotage. Exactly. Which is just really the wall is too high. So you don't see yourself coming to sabotage you, but there's nothing really inherently kind of like mystical mm-hmm. that is happening mm-hmm. there because mm-hmm. I think self-sabotage implies that like you don't know it's coming it's true you don't know it's coming but it's all programmed into your brain like there's just mm-hmm. a way to get it out and resolve it it's, mm-hmm. it's not that hard even so the um w- with that discussion right it, yeah. it just becomes <laughs> it becomes a you pairing the right things to do for addressing the problem that you're dealing with. And and then you can really just come at yourself in a way that feels a little bit better to you or a lot better is the, is the goal. I feel like I have so many questions. We're going to have to, <laughs> know. you know, like now I feel like, you know, talk about geeking out down a whole other hole. I feel like I, I could know. really could have a whole other podcast Telling. just on that topic, but so, uh, you know, know what's, funny is that we have that we started we used to do one podcast interview and we always would have where people would be like let's do a second one so then we were like we started going to people and saying let's do two let's book two podcast episodes right. at once so then we can get it covered and then what started yeah. happening was that then we do a third one so <laughs> that's basically to say I'm available I can come back 
Oh, uh, wonderful. If there's more <laughs> so questions, fun. we'll cover it. What do you want to talk about today? Yeah, yeah. No, I, and I would love to talk more about that because I think that is such a specific piece. But yeah, today right. let's, let's go back to this idea that we are, you know, this Ferrari. And let's try yeah. to give some instruction manual to our listeners who are, you know, are really in those, that menopause transition time. Let's, you know, can mm-hmm. you talk a little bit about the, our four phase cycle, you yeah. know, and what's sort of happening right now for us? Perfect. Absolutely. Okay. So I, I love this. I, I love, I love nerding about this. Um, mm-hmm. We also have um, season one of our podcast is a rundown of the cycle start to finish and the four Ooh, phases is completely deconstructed. So that is 24 a 24 part season. And so it will have a lot more detail that I can't cover today. So four phase cycle podcast, and you can go check that out. Season. I'll link that in the show notes to your, to your um, episode. Perfect. Season five is where I go through all the lab work. And so we talk about things like perimenopause and things like that. So that, Mm -hmm. that is, that's all resources that are available um, and things like that. All right. So with the female cycle, the female cycle is can inherently be chunked up into these four sections. And just when we look at the physiology, there are many, many, many people and different groups of thinking or different types of thought that everybody has looked at the female cycle and it breaks up in four naturally. Mm-hmm. So that is not something that we invented right? We didn't come up with this concept of breaking it up because when you look at it, most people come to a similar conclusion. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the case. And it's interesting how much the four phases also seem to track with things like that are present in nature, kind of like the seasons. Mm -hmm. And so there are these overarching concept of flowing with seasons and cycles and um, you know, flow and evolution and transformation that seems to be mirrored in our external world internally. Mm-hmm. Yes. So then, then the female cycle encompasses, and that's why kind of what I mean, it's all about who you are and not just about the period is that that whole cycle you're flowing through, imagine flowing through all four seasons every single month. Mm-hmm. You could get a lot of Christmases in, right? <laughs> yes. You, you could like have a lot. And so that is what we have. Women then are, are holders and carriers of the full spectrum, birth mm. to death every single month. Wow. Which is awesome, right? Yeah. Women are so, amazing. I know. Right. So, so then the question becomes, and where do you split up the four? Because we're all splitting it up, but where do you call each one? And this is where there's a little bit of disagreement on Mm. the way that I think though, is based off physiology. The, the, where I want to start is where the decision is being made. So at the brain level, at the central nervous system level that says the brain is going to take everything into account, everything you see, hear, feel, experience, have in your past is going to take that information. And then the hypothalamus, which sits in the brain and is the general that decides what ends up in your bloodstream hormones, autoimmunity, inflammatory cascades, complement system, doesn't matter. The whole, the whole soup in the blood, the hypothalamus is the one that's going to look at all of that and make the decision. The time where it starts doing that and setting up the cycle is actually when you're getting your period. Mm. So for us, phase one starts when it starts, because that's when the brain is deciding how that whole thing's going to go. So we have phase one, starting with the period. The bleed, the actual bleed. The actual bleeding. Mm -hmm. Spotting doesn't count because spotting generally is a progesterone issue and that is phase four. Right. Okay. So phase one kicks off in your period, uh, on the first day of your period, full flow, lasts for about seven days for a regular Mm -hmm. 28-day cycle, which of course, plus or minus, we talk about that, and then goes, goes into phase two about mm-hmm. seven days later. And phase two culminates in ovulation. 
Mm. Right. That's the, it's what culminates reaching that peak. That's where it's headed towards. Yeah. Got it. You still finish phase two, even if you didn't successfully ovulate, because Mm. ovulation is not an on and off switch. You are more or less successful each time. And Mm. the level of success will determine the level of progesterone you make. And therefore, that estrogen Mm. progesterone balance and will have everything to do with how your cycle goes and how you feel during the week leading up to it and after. That's why it's all just, you know, it's not about that week. It's about... It's about the whole thing. But right. anyways, that, that's where it starts. Mm-hmm. And in the beginning, it starts because that's an estrogen game. The brain is telling the ovaries to make a certain amount of estrogen. And that estrogen is telling the follicles, the eggs and the ovaries to develop. At first, a couple of them develop. But then eventually, as long as the estrogen signal is correct and all of the other signaling is correct, then one of the follicles will win. Mm -hmm. and or one of the eggs will win and it'll create a you know a a mature egg to ovulate yeah Mm -hmm. or at least some sort of immature egg to try to ovulate right which is very relevant for perimenopause that's why i'm going with all this you can hear you can hear the setup right you're already probably feeling me on this so yes, that is all the estrogen game. And, and of course, that's how we end up with polycystic ovaries because that choice isn't made because the instructions aren't right. So all the eggs then develop and then you can see a bunch of, a bunch of the spots on the eggs on ultrasound or on the ovaries, excuse me. So yeah, that is the, that's essentially what's happening in the first half. Um, and, and it's that whole full setup on how it plays out. And of course, uh, that then impacts how we're thinking and feeling along the way in that time. And so I'll, I'll circle back around to that once I, once I finish like what the physical body is doing. Yeah. So once, once we're in phase two, really it's all about ovulating or attempting to, uh, mm-hmm. and, and the body is focusing on optimizing that. Mm. or it doesn't think that ovulation is important because it's too much in survival mode and it doesn't care and it won't do it. Mm. So that's what's happening phase two. Yep. So if you're like, gee, everybody says that I should be feeling awesome in phase two and motivated and that's not happening. It's pointing you. Yes. That's, that's why. So yes, it's not a personality thing. There's no, you don't need to feel guilty and ashamed about not feeling energetic. You just go figure out what's happening there. Mm Mm-hmm. And then phase three kicks off after attempted ovulation. And that's where the estrogen starts to plateau out. It has mm-hmm. peaked. Maybe if things have done well, uh, yeah. then it plateaus. And at that point, that's when progesterone, if we ovulated, will be rising to balance out estrogen. Mm. The level of progesterone we create is a direct reflection of the success of ovulation. Because there's only two places progesterone come from, either a follicle Mm -hmm. and the size of it depends on how much you make. Mm -hmm. So if it wasn't a very successful ovulation, you will end up with estrogen excess unless something else happened that dropped your estrogen too. Mm. Yeah. So that's how that happens. And then, um, shoot, I lost my train of thought because I got, what was it? You said there's two, there's only two ways we make progesterone or progesterone. Oh yeah. And then the placenta, right? So if you're not pregnant and you're not ovulating, you don't have progesterone. Got it. Right. That That's, um, people get a little confused about that mm-hmm. because they'll be like, well, I'm on pill, but I don't have progesterone. Like, of course you don't have progesterone. You just, you shouldn't, That that's not how that works. Yeah. So, um, and so then we have, um, the progesterone, whatever level that it is at compared to the estrogen Mm -hmm. it's a little less important about the absolute and a little more important about the ratio of how they're balanced in relation to one another but of course i mean absolute plays a role and then that that generally is ramping up week three Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And then week four is starting to come down. So depending on how successfully or not you ovulated, a lot of people have pretty bad PMS because their estrogen continues to remain high. Their progesterone is starting to peter out. They're feeling the estrogen excess and then estrogen will do things like go trigger histamine release. So people then will get bloated and constipated and a- anxious before their period. That's how it's happening. Mm, so as no. that all I know, right? Um, mm-hmm. It all makes sense. Yeah. Which the same thing, right? If the estrogen is higher and that's creating that right before the cycle in relation to progesterone, that can also happen on ovulation when estrogen peaks. So mm-hmm. those two spots are why women always say those two times. And at that point, uh, phase four, things start going down again. And once both estrogen and progesterone come down, then we start to have the next cycle. Right. So th- those are the four phases. And um, for a 28 day cycle, if you're just tracking, if you're looking at it, but you're not using your own physiology, you can split them up equally. Mm-hmm. But I actually think it's a little bit more like intentionally using this system when mm-hmm. we can track ovulation, either through basal body temperature tracking, my favorite, that's my favorite, or mm-hmm. LA strips. They're not as direct of an, there's not as much information, but it'll give you some. But once you track that, then you know where to split it. So Mm -hmm. let's say your cycle is 28 days, but you, you ovulate on day 12. Mm -hmm. And let's say this is in a world where you have optimized your hormones. You've done all that. This is support. And this is where you fall out because there is individual variation. So that could be normal. Mm Mm-hmm. That kind of person, though, isn't having a bunch of PMS and doesn't get suicidal at the end of her side, right? Like right, she's not right. having the symptoms because she's optimized. So yeah. we'd only make that determination once that was more true. But let's say that is happening and that's normal. Like I have a 26 day cycle. It's fine. I think I just, I just run a little short. Yeah, um, just, and that, that's, that's there's not, right. There's nothing wrong with it. And so, mm-hmm. What I would do then if I was 28 days and I ovulate on day 12, then I would split up the first, the first two need to be 12 days and the second two are the remaining days. So it'd actually be six days for phase one, six Mm -hmm. days for phase two. And then the two split would be longer because you're spending longer time. It's a more accurate reflection of your physiology as opposed to a standard female cycle. Right. Of course, depending on where you're at in this journey, there is, you know, you can be more or less nuanced. How do you personally check if you're ovulating? How do you track that for you? I personally do basal body temperature tracking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I like that. Now, when you've been doing that for years, you can get away with noticing patterns. Like at this Mm -hmm. point, when I don't, I actually know how I'm doing on that because once I'm like, oh, these are the thoughts that I have when this happens. These are the emotions that come up. Here's when I get bloated. Here's when I start to get a little more content. Here's when this happens. I'm like, oh yeah, I must not have, you know, fully successfully. I personally like having the data because I'm a little nerdy, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's not to say that The reason I bring that up is because it has to work for you. If the basal body temperature tracking makes you crazy Mm -hmm. and makes you freak out, right? This is our whole point. You can't keep doing something that's completely discongruent to you, right? So I need to take breaks because sometimes I have the infertility past hangover where I'm Mm -hmm. like, oh man, I, you know, this and this, and I start to get in my own head about the data. And I really have to take a step back the same way I used to have an eating disorder. I have Mm -hmm. to be really intentional about how I approach food. Mm -hmm. I can't just Mm -hmm. pop off with an elimination or not. I can't, I choose not to pop up with some really strict deprivation elimination diet because I know it's going to trigger me and it's going to kick me into fight or flight. And why would I do that? That's not going to help my hormones at all, even if the food is like the greatest thing on earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyways, that's what I mean by I'm going to say that, but it's with a heavy asterisk next to it. That If you will make yourself miserable with that Mm -hmm. information, don't Mm -hmm. do it. 
at the same that mind time. body connection is really yeah. significant right well you're your saying. hypo yeah your hypothalamus is listening to the soup that's created by your brain chemistry so if you're kicking off a bunch of negativity and you don't like what you're doing you hate it and you're miserable guess what the hypothalamus is going to hear you mm-hmm. can absolutely take the most expensive supplements on the planet and still not overpower your own mind it's in your mm-hmm. own body like it's going to win every time mm-hmm. and and sometimes you can make some progress but oftentimes that's where people are like me and I got better and then it came back or, mm-hmm. you know, I, I hit my forties and then things went downstream when I was fine before. Mm-hmm. It's just to, get, to give a little perspective. I just think for the listeners on what you're saying here that I think is so fascinating is that although you and I both like to geek out and we find data is to be really amazing feedback, mm-hmm. we have to be conscious of how, you know, we feel about the data and we're collecting yes. because even you know, these days people are really obsessed with, you know, having their sleep trackers, right? Yeah, like the aura really rings simple, and all right, that. Their sleep Daisy, trackers. Daisy, a really and great... Yes, but but some for some people, you can wake up, feel good, but then look at your watch and your watch oh my God. you didn't sleep well. And so now you're true. like, I didn't sleep well. And, and then you're is, upset. Yeah. When you went yeah. Been a, so, you oh my been gosh, I love that you picked up the sleep thing because I used to have a Fitbit and it was the same mm-hmm. thing where I would, you know, granted I was in residency, so like my sleep didn't look that great. But here's the thing. I was deciding to be in residency because I want to be a doctor. Like I wasn't going to do anything differently. So why was I going to put myself right. through that of looking at it and feeling bad about it when right. I'm consciously choosing it? So right. really we, it is, it's the same thing with food. I'll hear people be like, um, red meat and endometria and whatever. I've heard everything like, um, yeah. you name it, someone's poo pooed it. And, yeah. um, and we don't really play that game with anything, but mostly because you don't actually, in making the recommendation, that's a really dicey thing. You don't know what you're asking someone to do. So if yeah. you're like, hey, do this diet, what if that impacts now they're cooking separately, they feel disconnected from their family, they start fighting mm-hmm. with their partner, that you could mm-hmm. create significant impact in people's life in a very negative way mm-hmm. by willy-nilly throwing out these things instead of saying, how does this all fit within being of service to that person's goals in the way mm-hmm. that they are intentionally setting it at? Because mm-hmm. to to do something at the expense of your greater values, mm-hmm. you will always know that you sacrifice the greater value and it won't feel great. Mm. And so Living out yes, of integrity. Mm-hmm. Yep. The data is amazing, but it only if it works for you. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, chill on the data for a mm-hmm. second, figure out what you need to do. Now, what I don't ever recommend is being like, okay, well then I won't use it because that's a little bit shirking our autonomy and our inner authority because mm-hmm. I'm saying things have happened to me to make me like this and I'm just going to accept it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The same thing with the, okay, just because you haven't been taught about your body, cool, start now. So same thing here, decide then who you're going to be. And if that includes somebody who data is available to them, then take the action to become the person that the data is available to them. That is completely up to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think first and foremost, the connection we need to foster is like, how do I feel? Exactly. (laughs) How do I feel about in my body? Exactly. And it's not going through stuff. Yes, exactly. Ooh, I mean, we could have a whole thing about the emotional body um, on that subject, but really, really important. You're absolutely right about that. Yeah. So tell us more about, so now that we understand these phases, I think this is really cool. I haven't heard it quite explained this way, but I love it. Um, How, you know, maybe this is the best thing we can offer, you know, women who are listening to this podcast. How does this change or what changes that is causing the impact in these, you know, perimenopause experiences? Yes. Oh, in the, you mean how the physical body is impacting yeah. the, um, gotcha. I thought you were going to go with the experience throughout the whole phases. Oh. So that's, a, but we can also talk about that. Oh, I'm so torn. There's so many things. No, let's I, go. Yeah, I guess, I guess ultimately let's go with what are we experiencing yeah, perfect. in the body at this, at this stage? What yeah, are we perfect. feeling typically right now to know what to expect and, and really what that might mean for us? 
Perfect. Yeah, it's true because actually the four phases are still applicable all throughout perimenopause and menopause and even in older women. So Mm -hmm. a 70 or 80 year old one, we still do it. It's just the amplitude kind of the same way. If you look at teenagers, you're kind of like, Oh yeah, sometimes that thing's louder, right? (laughs) (laughs) Same thing. It's just a spectrum throughout life. And so what happens as we had a perimenopause can be a long period of time. It can, Mm -hmm. it can be the full day, the same way puberty can be a decade. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But here's the thing. But he, that see, it's funny that yeah. um, we all have that because that's been conditioned. Perimenopause mm-hmm. is not a state that you get in and stay. You can mm-hmm. you move in and out of perimenopause depending on what's happening. So for me, mm-hmm. when I was dealing with very low ovarian function when I was 26 and got diagnosed with, with infertility, I met the criteria for perimenopause. Then as I healed, I no longer did. The lab work Mm -hmm. didn't reflect that and neither did my symptoms. So Mm -hmm. you can flow in and out of it. So me saying it is common for perimenopause to impact someone a decade. Does it have to be like that? No. And just because you're in perimenopause does not mean that you have dysfunctional symptoms. You could, as you can imagine, if, if we are supposed to start and then stop ovulating at certain times Mm -hmm. that does have to get accounted for. So Mm -hmm. we do have to say that no matter how long it is, five years, 10 years, no matter how long you're in it, at some point you ovulate less and less frequently until you don't anymore. Mm -hmm. So you run out of eggs. (laughs) Exactly. Yes. And you, they're, I mean, they're in there and they're kind of decaying and, and there's just not the, the loudness of the signal isn't quite there to trigger that. And over time, it just, it's more of a spectrum that we have been led to believe. Cause even when Mm -hmm. you're not having a period for a while, you're still having all the internal stuff that happens there is just not at the level to actually cause a bleed and it, and it kind of peters out. Um, and so because it's one, kind of gradual decline that is happening these symptoms and the dysfunction are not an inherent part of that those Mm -hmm. are the symptoms are the conversation that the body says it says this isn't going as smoothly as it could Mm. but let's say around 40 42 45 Most people are starting to notice that not every single cycle, even when things are good, is an ovulatory one. So we start Mm -hmm. skipping stuff. And then the other ones, it's more likely that sometimes we could undershoot. There's less Mm -hmm. of a strong signal to the ovaries. So they just respond less, don't create as big of a follicle. So you have lower progesterone. So that kind of stuff is okay. As we optimize the system we still have that as in you ovulate less and you ovulate less successfully it's just that when things are listening to each other then the estrogen and the progesterone will be in line with each other and we don't Mm -hmm. have as much of the symptoms right so it's a it's not that it's not happening it's just a much less bumpy ride right i heard you say before that just we can bleed without have ovulation without ovulating. absolutely but yep. can we can we ovulate without bleeding usually not okay usually not i have had people say swear up and down that their basal body temperature tracking was like this and then they didn't mm-hmm. um but they've been very very few and far between and i just don't know i mean i was just what for example you it would be handy to get an ultrasound at that point and actually verify, mm-hmm. right? And, and mm-hmm. so there's lots of things that can happen right. there. But generally speaking, it would be highly unusual because the withdrawal of progesterone makes you bleed. Got it. That's that, and that's yeah. and that's what comes on the scene for the exactly. ovulation. That's yeah. What you're saying. So yeah. Right. For- right. So that's the yeah. you sit, you're in men- menopause and then you actually stop bleeding. You may have a little bit of estrogen where you attempt ovulation and create a little bit of a one, but you create such low progesterone in the grand scheme of things that the withdrawal doesn't cause the bleed. 
Right, right. So even in these, you know, 10 to, well, in the, in like the zero to 12 months when you actually achieve menopause or you haven't bled for, you know, as they say for a year, you are still, your body is still can be going, going through all of the emotions, but the messages just aren't strong enough to make anything yeah. happen. So it doesn't mean you won't yes. feel things or experience things almost in a cycle the way you used to. Absolutely. Means, and yeah. I've okay. even had 75 year old women say, wow, when you point this out, I do think that because when we talk about the emotions, mm. like why do all of us before a period are like, why are you chewing so loud, man? Right. Like yeah. that, <laughs> there's just patterns. And so, so when you're looking for them and you're starting to notice that within yourself, um, even, even later on, women will say that there is some of that there. And, um, let's think. So those of you listening who may have teenage girls, mm. there are anovulatory cycles on the front end of things. So menopause is actually just the reverse of the puberty. So there's a lot of what happens during puberty of the Mm -hmm. symptoms and the heavy bleeding are actually because of the lack of ovulation too. So the system gets up and running, runs for a while and then goes back down. And so that is okay. All Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to suck. And that's why the the state of perimenopause as it happens, there actually is no uh, to that. Mm-hmm. The same way that if puberty was supported and optimized and we all got what we needed and had great nutrition and never got traumatized mm-hmm. and had the perfect parents or whatever, that <laughs> puberty would go really different too, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, so it's I not mean, an it's... inherent part of the system. It's our yeah. navigation of it. And that's why we're saying our job is to empower people to navigate it. That's what they want because the fact that you may notice some things is an inherent part of being in the human meat suit. It does stuff, right? Yeah. But how did you call it a human meat suit? I did. I I have never heard that before. (laughs) Megan and I say that all the time. Some interesting, like Japanese word, meat suit, or did you actually say meat suit? Oh my god! I sure did. I sure said meat suit. Right, I'm like gonna use this. You, you should. I, I'm gonna, it um, yes, it does things, and and it has things, and it has cycles, and it has responses, and all of this. But mm-hmm. our our experience of it, and our interpretation, as in the narrative that we create around it, and then how that impacts our life, mm-hmm. that is actually just a, a completely movable piece. It's attached. But how it looks, what it looks, what it does to you and whether it works for you or not Mm -hmm. is not linked to it. Mm, And how cool is it that you can use that to actually improve the meat suit, right? (laughs) Because if you manage that better, then the the hypothalamus goes, oh, hey, we're not in crisis. We're not in survival. This isn't. Mm. I used to literally see spotting and just melt down. The the amount of times I've cried in a bathroom stall, because to me, spotting was this black box of there's something wrong with me and I'll never Mm. have a baby. And that the lack of detail and it led to so much fear. I didn't understand what was happening. Mm-hmm. And so fear predominated and then it fed into it. And so when people would be like, just relax and you'll get pregnant, I would be like, I swear to God, I'm going to poke your eyes out because yeah. how can I be relaxed when you're telling me all these things, eat like this, do like this, take these supplements, have sex with your husband, you know, do it. And, yeah. and I just was like, Oh my gosh, I don't, I I do not know how to do this. And that's why at some point I had to drop the whole thing. Yeah. And that was really painful. And I don't want other people to have to go through it. It shouldn't have you pushed up and backed into a corner for you to decide this isn't how I want life to feel. Isn't it amazing how the most fundamental ways our body is designed to behave like metabolizing you know, reproducing, resting and recovery are all cannot be forced. It it literally, you know, when you say that to someone like just relax and you'll get pregnant, just relax and you'll lose weight, which is actually a very, but nobody can just relax when they want to lose weight or when they want to get pregnant. If you could, you would, (laughs) right? Yeah. If that was already a, a strategy that worked, you'd be using it. Right, right. <laughs> it's not that, you know, just relax and you'll fall asleep is like the war. Just relax oh, and your anxiety will go away. You're like, oh yeah. my goodness. <laughs> yep. So when you read our bio, right, what did it say? Compassionate transformation. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And that is because we have gone to trainings. We have been in programs where people Mm -hmm. are like, hey, just do this and you'll be fine. And then we're like, but but I can't. And and I feel terrible at myself now. And that's uncompassionate. Mm -hmm. That is not whether you're a provider or a practitioner or a teacher or a podcaster or a parent Mm -hmm. who role models for a kid. It doesn't matter. But what it looks like is treating yourself well and Mm -hmm. giving yourself the resources to handle all of these things in life and feel good Mm -hmm. moving through it. Mm -hmm. And actually allowing the world to see that and witness it. And we all rise from it. Yeah, I I love that. And I think what you're doing here and, you know, just to kind of move us towards a close, like I think what's so powerful and what you've reminded the audience today is, is that this cycle is a part of us that we can actually use to navigate, I think is the word you say, to, Mm -hmm. to learn more about ourselves and live our most happy and fulfilling lives. Yeah. You know, we can use it and and really to empower women to learn the language of that. Learn the language of your body and that is a lot of what this is. Learn to understand it, to speak it and you'll be able to maybe relax a little bit more into it when you understand it and it's a gentle conversation and not something you're trying to force. Absolutely. I did remember I had one more thing about perimenopause yeah. that we got Tell distracted us. by this other thing. So Sorry. one of the other Sorry, everyone. No, it's okay. <laughs> I did that. I I'm so excited talking about this that like it just I, I could really just go into so many different directions. But mm-hmm. one of the things that is inherently uh, supposed to happen in perimenopause and in that transition is that the body transitions having the these numbers are really rough, so don't hang your hat on it. No but problem. generally when we're cycling, when we're in our like actual just mens- uh, pre-menstrual, right, you're in your 30s, you're in your 20s, it's like 90% ovarian function talking to mm-hmm. the hormones and then 10% adrenals mm-hmm. when we're talking okay. about creating these. Mm-hmm. As paramount perimenopause happens, more and more of the responsibility gets put on the adrenals. So then the adrenals say, hey, I'm going to be the one taking you through perimenopause and into menopause. Hmm. And that is why the baton. Yeah, exactly. And and that does lead to some things like if you've seen the little ladies with the mustaches and stuff, like there's some, there's some outflow things of what happens there and why, but that, that is what's happening in that transition period. If you have pre-existing adrenal problems, the bounce on perimenopause and menopause so much harder because no one is there to catch you, right? If you have burnout adrenals, if you have belly weight, if you have fatigue, if you can't sleep well, if your metabolism is slowed, if you can't build muscle, if your energy isn't regular throughout the day, if you get a second wind at night, all of these things, are just, I just listed off like a whole slew of cortisol things. That's your yep. clue that something's going on and your body is talking to you and saying there's something up with the adrenals because if you're expecting them to take on more of the support they need to be ready for that and if they (sighs) aren't supported they will absolutely let you know no we're not taking this baton take that baton and you know put it wherever (laughs) (laughs) like excuse me you're gonna ask me to do one more thing now (laughs) exactly and they're like no thank you and then people don't feel so hot. So that is, that's a, that's an important oh. distinction to make in terms of it. That's why we can't run ourselves into the ground as when and people will be like, but my husband can work seven days a week and do intermittent fasting and go low carb and do, you know, um, habitat for humanity. I don't know. I'm just like making a bunch of stuff up, but like, if that's not working out for you, stop doing it, right? Like you have to figure out how to meet your goals and your values in another avenue that doesn't require that same sacrifice. Yeah. Your husband's a jalopy. You're a Ferrari. Make sure you know the difference. (laughs) We cannot compare the two. (laughs) Exactly. Yes. And um, I know that in this discussion, it can sound a little bit like male, female. And to be honest, there is Lots of things that impact men that society, they also have their own cyclical stuff and we completely ignore it and they have even less education about it. So as right. much as we um, are kind of leaving them out here, let's just acknowledge that so that of as course. we go towards the men in our lives, we can mm-hmm. also treat them with compassion and love right. and, you know, not just be like, hey, how's that? 
How's that super easy fridge working out for you? <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, you're right. It's, but let's let's take the, on the responsibility to know our navigation, to you know, uh, read, learn, to be able to read our our uh, and our instruction manual on how to operate ourselves yes. because it's a very empowering thing. Like you said, mm-hmm. like what can you do with a Ferrari if you actually know how to drive it? You know, exactly <laughs> right. If you're most stuck. You can go really fast if you want to. That's why our stuff's mm-hmm. called Transformation Accelerator. Mm-hmm. Is that you can either let life carry you to your transformation and just react to whatever. Yeah. Or or you can say, this is who I'm going to be, and therefore I will transform intentionally in that way. And then you choose to accelerate yourself towards that identity. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like you just, and and the thing is that you can. So what we do is we just offer like, do you want to go faster and become who you want to be? Right. And it's completely up to each person to then decide. Some people want Mm -hmm. to, and some people don't. Some people are ready for it. Some people aren't. Yep. That's kind of the question for each person. Are you you ready to change? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What, What do you choose? Yeah. Because it is, and not making a choice is a no, right? It's saying yeah. no, I will not change. It's not yeah. actually an still identity. a choice. Yeah, yes. it's still yeah. a choice. Yeah, and this is what I think is such an important thing to recognize when you're choosing. To, you know, when you're working with a coach or with a, a yeah. practitioner, you know, is that you really a lot of it comes down to you being ready to change, right? You being right. ready. You know, things will work when you're ready to invest that time and effort and energy into yourself. So. Absolutely, and same for coaches, right? Unless you're mm-hmm. role modeling, unless you're getting the results that you are taking people through and really Mm -hmm. getting that for yourself and becoming that, then Mm -hmm. there's more work to be done. That's not to say we can't help people, but at the same time, we have to recognize all of these components and continue to choose to become who we are. Because the fact of the matter is, is as long as we're in the meat suit, we're not done. You know? (laughs) Oh, your sound got really quiet. I don't know if that's just me, but. I'm always but, laughing. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. I have little ears. My AirPods fall out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, what I, I just like to ask everyone this when, you know, when we do interviews, what do you have like a, a, a sort of a neuro, adrenal nourishing routine that you do for you to make sure that or your or a hormone nourishing routine? What are what is what are kind of your no matter what's in a day that you like to do for you? Ooh, that's a really good one. I'm going to be perfectly honest and say the type of person that I am is um, I am very flowy and I have a high degree of flexibility. Mm-hmm. And that generally means that I am, my toolkits are very, very broad, as in I mm-hmm. go and find out many, many avenues in each category to support myself in each area because I like the flexibility to choose every day. Mm-hmm. So I am mm-hmm. inher- not inherently one of those people that day in and day out does stuff. That's now, some thing, people yeah. are like that and it works very well for them. And that's just like a right handedness or left handedness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. So I will just say that because what I'm going, you know, it's a lot of choices for me, but Mm -hmm. the categories that I'm going to choose is how am I encouraging myself to be in heal and learn state? Mm -hmm. That's rest and digest the parasympathetic. So Mm -hmm. If I hope to heal and if I hope to learn, which is predominantly actually what I'm doing, I'm either mm-hmm. learning or I'm teaching, which is another way to say learning, um, mm-hmm. or I'm healing, digesting, that's what I want to do most of the day. So mm-hmm. really what I'm asking is, how am I helping my physical body actually feel that way? Mm-hmm. That kind of yeah. question, though, has many different answers, because on on one day, I might do parasympathetic exercises like vagal nerve stimulation, thumping on my chest, ear scissors, cross body tapping. Mm-hmm. That may be that. And sometimes it's more of the, ooh, actually the stuff that I had planned today is something that I am emotionally unavailable for. Mm-hmm. And I will spend my day completely dysregulated and ramped up because I consciously know that this is not the best thing for me to do. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I'm making uh, more leadership for myself decisions on what am I going to do for today? Because it's mm-hmm. going to impact my physiology. Yeah. Uh, 
the eating is a non-negotiable for me though, Mm -hmm. with my history. So I generally go for eating three meals. Mm -hmm. I have very few food rules, but I try to eat or not try. I do. I eat three meals, even if they're they're smaller, Mm -hmm. but I have three meals. I don't skip and I balance my plate, something fat, something carbs, something protein, and then nutrients where I can get them within there. So yeah. that that is all I do. But that, that mm-hmm. generally means like I don't have crackers, right? It, if I'm going to do that, it's going to be beef jerky, crackers, almond butter, whatever, right? Like yeah. I, I'm going to actually Some stack cucumbers. it. So yeah. mm-hmm. Most of what people are doing with their food, I'll be honest, can be accomplished with those two things. Mm-hmm. So, I agree. <laughs> exactly. So I agree. So that, and for the hypothalamus to send a starvation signal from many, whether you're cutting too low carb, too low calorie, skipping meals, going too long in between meals, it's all the same. It ends up being, Hey, we're not getting what you need. And now is not a good time for baby. It doesn't matter. It doesn't care if you're in perimenopause and don't actually want a baby. It just will tank your progesterone. So, Uh, um, (laughs) right. Yeah. It's like your mm -hmm. body is still taking that seriously. Mm -hmm. And so that's a non-negotiable. And then for me to connect with myself, be honest, unless I know what I'm feeling in response to something, I don't have a compass. I don't even, Mm -hmm. if I don't know how I feel or what I'm thinking or where I'm in conflict with myself about it, I can't even look for solutions. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm dealing with. So all of that can only happen when I have set aside time to connect with myself. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, for me, that looks like meditation, hypnosis. I make my own audio. You know, obviously we're, uh, both of us are hypnosis trained and quantum Mm -hmm. time technique trained and all that. So, so we create that for ourselves. One of those is going to happen over the course of uh, the day and Mm -hmm. more than likely it will happen early. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I like so that. So it's, are, it's very proactive, right? A very nourishing thing ahead of time, those proactive self connections. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause I, a lot of um, what people deal with, whether they're like stuck or they're with their health, they have a lot of questions. They're like, should I do the supplement? Should I do this mm-hmm. uh, diet? Because this person says this is good and this person says this is good and I can't decide. Well, really, agency and empowerment looks like making the call of what's best for you. And then if you need to change your mind, making the call again, but why don't people do that? Well, they're scared to disagree with the authority. They're unsure if they can trust their own intuition. They worry about making a wrong move because they don't know if they can handle how they'll feel about themselves when they inevitably realize they mess up. There's a lot of these things standing in the way of that. And it's not because you don't know what to do. Yeah. Right. Because we get, yeah, it, things are in our own. Oh my God. Yeah. So, so much there, here. Yeah. there's a lot. Of, and that's why without the pause for self awareness, you can't actually work with any of that. Yeah. You, but, and that's what people will just get distracted. Or what they do is they choose an outcome they future predict. So if you're frustrated, you'll be like, oh, I'll never get better. I'll never menopause will just suck, whatever. Yeah. Right. Mindset you don't actually know that. You don't even have the power to predict that. No. But it is mm-hmm. easier than leaving it open-ended because at least, you know, you're making the call and you're like, cool, I'll just feel bad about it. And then I can deal with that. Yeah. Or you feel good about it on a given day and you're like, no, this will totally get better. Yeah. But then it's a, a seesaw up and down instead of really saying, Ooh, I'm acknowledging that this is happening now and I'm acknowledging that I still want it to be better in the future. And how do I support both aspects of me not giving Mm -hmm. up, but also not gaslighting myself along the way and being like, no, no, I'm totally fine now. I'm not crying in the bathroom. Right. This means this means I'm okay. This means I'm yeah. okay. This means I'm okay, right? Yeah. Right. So. No, that's not yeah. it. That's not it. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Alex. This has been an amazing conversation. Oh, I think I'm like so I, you Thanks know, I'm so fascinated me. by this. I re- how can people I know you guys have some amazing programs and some things coming up. What how can people reach out to you to if they're ready to accelerate themselves, if they're ready mm-hmm. to just learn more even about themselves, which you so eloquently do? Um, what is the best way for them to find you? Awesome. Yeah. Come, um, come uh, join us on the podcast. If you, for Faith Cycle podcast, or even if you search Dusty Ginger, we're actually going to be renaming some things. 
Oh. Um, and so if you search Dusty Ginger, it'll come up. Yeah. That'll be cool. More, more on that coming. We, we're in the works ourselves. And uh, that is our predominant way. And so we are actually going to increase the amount of podcast episodes that we have per week up to potentially even doing it five days a week. Oh, that's exciting. That will be our predominant way. Um, And and then they are also also on uh, YouTube. And sometimes it's a video. Sometimes it's just the audio. But you Mm -hmm. can find it there as well. We hang out uh, on Instagram. It's at Zesty underscore Ginger. Mm -hmm. Um, And and we have a bunch of stuff there. Highlights, uh, reels, all sorts of stuff uh, for resources for y'all. And then what we have coming up is we have a super exciting uh, weekend retreat that is about compassionate transformation of habits. How do you transform your habits that are a reflection of your identity from the brain-based level? So we're going to be doing that in a retreat in Virginia in January. And then there is a personal retreat that we are a personal breakthrough for people who want to come for a week and transform that is going to be in June. Mm -hmm. And so if you are working on yourself, if you are in that space, just shoot us an email support at zestyginger.com and we will help you either, you know, if you know you want to come to the January, we'll get you set up. If you're like, this is what I'm dealing with, we'll just kind of help you figure it out. No problem with that too. And then we have our, we have a program called Health Transformation Accelerator. And this is our 12 week program that takes 12 weeks to teach and have you live out our seven step transformation process. There's, so there's a, a, our seven steps to include the physical, the mental, emotional, the spiritual, and all of them are represented. So included in the program is the option to test your brain chemistry and to actually get functional lab work and to get a customized protocol created for you. Wow. Or if, if you don't want to do that, there is actually a different track where you still can support your brain chemistry, but it's it's implemented and done through a different way. So the 12 weeks include everything from functional testing to mindset work, to emotional processing help to, you know, unpacking uh, spirituality, what's your place in the world? How do you see yourself? It's the whole thing. And we have the way that we run it is that it's a 12 week program and then you can stay on in the family. So people repeat it. It's a seven step process that we rinse and repeat. So we've been doing Mm -hmm. our seven steps for years. And that is how I went to med school and became a doctor. And Megan has, you know, um, does her uh, stage speaking. She got her lake house that way. Literally anything that you want, you would just apply to it. So most of our Mm -hmm. people start out with health. But as they heal, people all inherently understand that health is just the springboard for the rest of your life. Health, mm-hmm. no one wants health just to sit there. They want health because you want to go do stuff with it. So yeah. at that point, it gets really fun. And yeah. people start sticking around for the intentional transformation of who they want to be. So that kicks off uh, in, in February. So just come hang out with us and you'll start yeah. hearing about these things. Amazing. Thank you so much. I mean, I'll put all the links uh, to, to find them in the show notes. So just swipe up and grab those, these guys. And thank you so much, Dr. Alex. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This is lovely. Bye everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on the Period Whisperer podcast. I want to encourage you to reach out to me directly and message me if there are topics or things you're struggling with so we can address those right where you are at. And of course, if you loved this episode, if you learned something, make sure to share it with your friends and please rate and review it wherever you get your podcasts.